Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. It's been about six months since the last time we did an installment of six impossible episodes, but it's been almost six years since we did one that was dedicated to listener requests. Uh, I guess not really six years, if we're being exact. The last one was on December 4th of 2017, so it's been it's been five years since we rounded up listener requests. So were you just fibbing to make it all sixes? Yeah, I was. Okay. Okay. I, was. I wasn't sure. Sometimes I'm slow on jokes. Yeah, when I looked at it uh, on the calendar, I was like, well, it's been six years, and then I actually did math, which, as we've said, arithmetic is a struggle for me. So, <laughs> anyway... We get so many requests from listeners, and we love them. Y'all bring things to our attention that we might not have ever noticed or thought about otherwise, and then sometimes something is on our radar, but we get so many listener requests for it that it becomes clear that we need to make it a priority. Some of our listener requests, though, are for topics that just don't have a lot of information available. And it's totally possible that the information exists somewhere, like maybe in old town hall records or somebody's gigantic collection of many linear feet of personal papers that they've donated to an archive or somebody's attic. Uh, There are lots of historians and other researchers who do all kinds of original research into these kinds of previously unexamined primary sources, but that is really not compatible with putting out two new episodes of a podcast every week. Um, like, we cannot take a month off to to drive down to a small town and start combing through somebody's uh, old records. So, I mean, we could, but it would mean you don't get a new episode for, like, months. Yeah, it would it would not work out for continuing to have new episodes of the show. So for folks who are new to our show, Six Impossible Episodes is when we take shorter looks at six topics that for one reason or another aren't really doable as a full-length episode. And that just lines up nicely with our many listener requests for topics that are a little bit shorter on the information. That's what we're going to do today. And heads up, even though today's six stories are short, uh, some of them are kind of intense, We're going to talk about things that involve murders, including the attempted murder of a baby, uh, a tomb that included some human and animal sacrifices, and there's also some physical and sexual abuse and torture. There's just a lot. (laughs) Just because they're short doesn't mean they're all lighthearted. (laughs) Wee! Yeah. (laughs) I would say that collectively, like, this doesn't become an episode that's horrifying to me, but I just did want to kind of give that heads up. And so first is from an email from our listener, Greg, which said in part, quote, I don't think you've ever covered this one, and it may be a part of your Six Impossible Episodes episodes because I'm not sure there's enough material, but have you ever heard of the Iron Mountain Baby? So Greg learned about this story after being cast in a musical called Bright Star by Steve Martin and Edie Brickell. Bright Star has some of the same elements as this story, but the show is set in North Carolina in the 1920s and 40s, rather than when and where this actually happened, which was in Missouri in the early 1900s. It was totally news to me that Steve Martin and Edie Brickell had made a musical together. I missed that entirely when it happened. (laughs) It was not to me, but I'm not a musicals person, so I had not sought it out to know anything about it. Sure. So, William Helms was a farmer living outside Irondale, Missouri, and on August 14th, 1902, he was near a railroad trestle that crossed the Big River, and a train passed by from the St. Louis Iron Mountain and Southern Railroad. After the train had gone, Helms heard a sound from the vegetation that was growing along the river, and when he went to investigate it, he found a baby who had apparently been thrown from the moving train, tucked inside a satchel along with a change of clothes and some black thread. The baby was probably just a few days old. Sources contradict each other about just how badly this infant was injured. Some say it was just minor bumps and bruises. 
Other accounts say that people were very afraid he was not going to survive. Efforts to find this baby's parents were unsuccessful, and William and his wife Sarah took the baby in even though they were both in their later years. They named him William Moses Gould Helms. William, after the man who'd found him, Moses because he had been found among the rushes along the big river, and Gould after the man who owned the railroad. The Helmses legally adopted William when he was six, and he grew up and went to Southwest State Teachers College in Springfield, Missouri, which later became Missouri State University. His education was funded by the Iron Mountain Railroad, which later became the Missouri Pacific Line, and he was basically famous. His story was widely reported from the time he was found in the satchel. An Iron Mountain Baby Fund was established to help with the expenses involved with his care and upbringing. The St. Louis Republic bought a cow and her calf as part of these fundraising efforts. Newspapers updated the public on how the so-called Iron Mountain Baby was doing at various points of his life. And this really went way beyond Missouri. For example, there was an illustrated story that was syndicated in papers as far away as San Francisco in November of 1902. And it wasn't just news reports. Shortly after the baby had been found, local minister John Barton wrote a ballad called The Iron Mountain Baby. This was probably part of an effort to raise money for him. The song first appeared in print in 1909, and it starts, I have a song I'd like to sing, it's awful but it's true, about a babe thrown from a train by a mother I know not who. This poor little babe, a few days old, was in a satchel lane, its little clothes around it fold and thrown out from the train. And the song continues from there in possibly the most straightforwardly obvious rhyming couplets ever written. Yeah, I originally had the whole song in here and was like, this is embarrassing to have to read. One of the folk song databases that uh, I was looking at with all the lyrics in it had this notation that was like, this song is terrible. It is really bad. I cannot believe how just like patently obvious the entire rhyme scheme and like it's not a very original song. William, however, really didn't like being known as the Iron Mountain Baby. He eventually got married, had a child of his own, reportedly did not ever tell his son about this part of his life. William Moses Gould Helms died on January 31st, 1953, at the age of about 51. In addition to the musical that we already mentioned, there is also a novel by Evald Boswell called The Iron Mountain Baby that was published in 2006. Moving on, we got an email from listener Scott that also referenced our impossible episodes. Scott included, quote, a copy of my role-playing campaign, Legion of Liberty, Superheroes of 1776, an alternate revolutionary war with superheroes. The first adventure might make a good episode, although it might be in the impossible episodes category. Leslie's Retreat, the weird and comical incident that almost started the war in Salem in February 1775. Leslie's Retreat, also called the Salem Gunpowder Raid, happened about two months before the battles of Lexington and Concord. Tensions had been escalating between Britain and its colonies in North America for years, and Colonel David Mason of Salem, Massachusetts, had started preparing for the possibility of war. In 1774, he bought some number of French cannons. Sources contradict about exactly how many cannons there were, and he hid them. When military governor Thomas Gage, general in the British Army, heard about these cannons, he made plans to send troops to Salem to seize them. But the people of Salem were prepared for that possibility when Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Leslie and part of the 64th Regiment of Foot arrived in nearby Marblehead by ship during Sunday morning services on February 26, 1775, they really expected to be able to get to Salem and move through the town without a lot of resistance. They thought everybody was going to be busy in church. A lookout spotted the ship, though, and raised the alarm, By the time British troops got to a bridge south of town that they needed to cross, the residents had already started taking that bridge apart. The British soldiers repaired the bridge and crossed it, moving roughly north through Salem, but 
When they got to the North River on the other side of town, they were stopped again. This time, the bridge involved was a drawbridge, and it had been raised from the other side. And the other side of the river was where the cannons were reported to have been hidden. This turned into a stalemate, with Lieutenant Colonel Leslie faced off against Captain John Felt, who was in charge of the Salem militia. Leslie demanded that the bridge be lowered, and Felt refused, backed up by a whole bunch of locals who were just jeering at the soldiers from the other side of the river. People have compared this to that scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where they're yelling at the (laughs) French, and they have the whole fesh la vache scene. And this went on for the better part of the day, so imagine the Holy Grail is eight hours long. (laughs) With Leslie trying to convince Felt and his supporters to let him cross, finally promising that he and his troops would go no farther than 50 rods, would not harm any person or property, and then would go back to Marblehead. That way, he could honestly say he had crossed the bridge and looked for the cannons but found nothing. Finally, the two sides did reach an agreement. Leslie and his troops were allowed to cross the bridge. They marched for a little bit, then they turned around and went back to Marblehead and from there back to Boston. Very little property was damaged during all of this. Aside from the bridge that had already been repaired, there were three gondolas that the people of Salem scuttled so that the troops could not use them. It's believed that the only person injured in all of this was Joseph Witcher, who was foreman of the local distillery and was ordered to stop scuttling those gondolas, but refused. Instead, he bared his chest and dared the soldiers to stab him with their bayonets. In the words of a 19th century account by Charles M. Endicott, quote, they pricked his breast so as to draw blood, He was very proud of this wound and afterward in life was fond of exhibiting it. Well, yeah, got a knife fight with a bayonet. Come on, show that to everybody. It is possible there could have been a whole episode on this one. There is a book about it, but that book is also very short. Uh, Not counting things like the index and notes, it's only about 120 pages. And only one chapter is actually on the retreat itself. A lot of the book is more focused on kind of picking through all the contradictory accounts of the day than laying out one single narrative. Yeah, books like that can be fascinating to read, but it's trickier to make that information into a narrative structure for an audio podcast. There are at least two historical markers related to this in Salem. One is a marker for Leslie's retreat, calling it, quote, the first open resistance to the king by the colonials and the first blood shed in America's war for independence. And then about 500 feet away, there's another one that marks, quote, the first armed resistance to the royal authority. There have also been various reenactments of this carried out over the years. Uh, We will get to a couple of totally different stories after we take a quick sponsor break. Next, at least two listeners have asked for an episode on Lady Howe, also called Fu Howe, Fu uh, being an honorific, roughly meaning the same thing as Lady Most recently, Mimi came across her name in the New York Times, not in an article about her, but as more of an aside in a review of a book called The Greatest Invention, A History of the World in Nine Mysterious Scripts. Fu Hao lived during the 13th century BCE, and as is often the case when someone lived that long ago, tracking down specific information on her is rather hard. A lot of what we know about her comes from objects that were found in a tomb that is believed to be hers. The tomb was rediscovered in 1976, and at that point, it was still intact. That sets it apart from other Shang Dynasty tombs, most of which were looted long before they were rediscovered. In particular, we know about Fu Hao from inscriptions on bones and shells that were used for divination purposes. These ceremonies involved large, flat bones and shells, like ox scapulae or tortoise shells. These would be inscribed with statements that described something either going well or going poorly or stating something as an affirmative or a negative. And then the shell or the bone would be held to a piece of hot metal until it cracked. 
those cracks would be interpreted as revealing which of those statements was true. Based on these inscriptions and other objects from the tomb, we know that Fuhao was a queen and royal consort of Wu Ding, 21st king of the Shang dynasty. He is recorded as having 64 wives. One story around this number is that he married one woman from each of the tribes in his kingdom to try to maintain peace among them. Fu Hao was one of the highest-ranking women among these wives. She was mother to the heir apparent and also a high-ranking military general, second-in-command to Wu Ding. This was not a ceremonial position. There were generals under her command who she led into battle. Divination records reveal these little glimpses of her life, like when she was pregnant, trying to divine whether things would go well when she gave birth, or whether a battle she was leading was going to go favorably or unfavorably. One set of divination questions involves Wu Ding asking if Fu Hao should be allowed to lead 13,000 soldiers into battle. The records suggest that the answer was yes, but there are also some questions about this because Shang Dynasty army units were usually more like a third of that size. So it's like, was this force really that big? And if so, why was it so much bigger than normal? We don't really know. Based on some of the inscriptions, she was also likely a high priestess and a diviner herself. In terms of her tomb's other contents, there were at least 1,600 burial objects, as well as 16 people and six dogs who were buried with her as a ritual sacrifice. The objects included items made from bronze, jade, stone, bone, and ivory, about 200 bronze ritual vessels, sacrificial axes and daggers, and more than 130 other weapons. The tomb also contained about 6,000 cowrie shells, which were used as currency. Fu Hao died at the age of 33, and the cause is not noted anywhere, so there's speculation that she may have been injured in a battle or that she died due to complications from childbirth. After her death, she was deified, and it's believed that the area above her tomb was an open-air shrine for people to leave weekly offerings and sacrifices to her. Given her status, it's really not totally clear why her tomb was not close to others that belonged to Shang Dynasty royalty, but the fact that it was not is almost certainly why it was still intact by 1976. And honestly, this seems like someone who could be a fascinating full-length podcast or a two-parter or even something like a TV miniseries. But gleaning all of that information just from burial objects and divination records is so, so tricky. I feel like if it were adapted for TV, it would be a lot of speculation and yeah. fictionalized uh, expansion of the story, and then people might be chagrined it's yeah. not accurate. Sort of like we have an assortment of pieces from a jigsaw puzzle, but like not the complete picture. <laughs> Moving on, listener Grant sent an email and a comment on one of our Facebook posts asking if we had ever done a podcast on Beatrice Chanchi, who most English speakers would pronounce as Beatrice. You're thinking these letters aren't adding up to a a name for me. It's uh, spelled the same way as Beatrice. We had not done an episode on her, and she and her story have been depicted in a lot of literature and artwork and music and theater. And a lot of that has, at this point, really overshadowed what's actually documented about this story. Count Francesco Cenci lived in Rome in the 16th century and was very widely disliked. He had a reputation for being abusive, including physically and sexually abusive, and one of the targets of his abuse was his daughter, Beatrice. And she and others had reported his behavior to authorities in Rome, but Francesco was rich and powerful and had not faced any kind of consequences. In 1595, reportedly after learning that Beatrice had gone to the authorities, Francesco moved her to a castle fortress outside of Rome, and he moved her along with his wife, Lucrezia, who was Francesco's second wife and Beatrice's stepmother. This castle was isolated, especially compared to living in Rome, and he became even more abusive there. On September 9th, 1598, Plautilla Calvetti, the castle's housekeeper, 
heard screaming, and went to investigate. She found Beatrice silently looking down from her bedroom window. The screaming was coming from her stepmother. Francesca was dead on the ground below, along with part of the wooden balcony he had apparently been standing on when it collapsed. He had landed in a rocky, steep area below the window, and ladders were needed to bring his body up. As his body was being cleaned, it became obvious that he had not just died in a balcony collapse. His body was already cold, and his injuries didn't line up with having fallen from a great height. Among other things, it looked like he had been stabbed through the eye. The sheets in his bedroom were clean. They seemed to have actually been changed, but an investigation found blood spatters on the walls. Soon there were rumors that Beatrice had conspired to have her father murdered. She, her stepmother, and her brothers, Giacomo and Bernardo, were all arrested. So was the castle's castellan or warden, Olimpio Calvetti, who was the housekeeper's husband. Apparently, Beatrice and Olimpio had been having an affair, and she had convinced him to help with this plan. There was also a hired hitman involved who fled when the conspiracy was discovered and was later killed by one of the Count's relatives. So as we said earlier, people did not like this man. He had a reputation for cruelty and abuse, and in some accounts, he'd even been suspected of multiple murders and had bribed his way out of being charged with committing them. So Beatrice and her family had a lot of popular support and sympathy. People demanded that they all be set free. But Pope Clement VIII ordered them all to be tortured. Olimpio Calvetti died under that torture, and while being tortured, Beatrice's brother Giacomo confessed everything that had happened. Today, confessions under torture are not considered to be reliable. But this confession ultimately led to Beatrice, Lucrezia, and Giacomo all being executed on September 11th, 1599. Her brother Bernardo was only 12 at the time, and after seeing his family members executed, he was spared from it himself. Instead, he was made a galley slave. The church seized the Cenci family's property, and there is speculation that this had been the reason for having them executed. As we said, there are so many written and visual depictions of this. And at this point, all of those depictions and their fictionalized elements are remembered way more than the historically substantiated details. There is an oil painting believed to be of Beatrice, possibly painted while she was imprisoned for this crime. It's been variously attributed to different painters over the years, including Guido Reni, Elisabetta Siriani, or Genova Cantafoli. An 18th century account by Ludovico Antonio Moratoni is pretty romanticized, especially in its treatment of Beatrice as this, like, purely innocent teenager. This, plus this painting that shows her as kind of a wistfully tragic person, like, that has formed the template for how other people have approached her story. That together, the painting and that earlier work, became a source for a lot of other literature, including Percy Shelley's verse drama, The Senshi. There's also speculation that Caravaggio was at the execution and that it informed his painting of Judith and Holofernes. We are going to talk about more impossible episode topics after we first pause for a little sponsor break. Next up, we have the comment that really inspired this whole episode and made me go, it's time for a six impossible episodes that's just these listener requests that we need more information on. Essie commented on one of our Facebook posts asking for an episode on Ella Williams, also known as Aboma the Giantess. She had a link to an article on Aboma the Giantess that was written by Jada Hampton at the Uncle Junior Project. The Uncle Junior Project is dedicated to the lives and histories of Black circus performers. And most of what I was able to find about Ella Williams was also in that article. There may be other records on her somewhere, but what we know about her at this point is mainly gleaned from things like newspaper articles, advertisements, and pamphlets about her appearances. 
According to most sources, Ella Williams was born Ella Grigsby in South Carolina, and her family had been enslaved prior to the U.S. Civil War. Ella reportedly changed her last name from Grigsby to Williams because Grigsby was the name of her family's enslavers. Some accounts say that she was born in 1865, not long after the end of the U.S. Civil War. But an article about her was published in the Devon and Exeter Daily Gazette in 1914 that gives her age as 32. That would put her birth year almost two decades later in 1882. Now, it is not unusual for a performer to disguise their age a bit, but that is almost a 20-year difference. During Ella's teenage years, it became clear that she was going to be very tall. There are some accounts that say her family attributed this to her having a bout with malaria just before she was about to enter puberty, but it's not totally clear who said that, whether they believed it, or whether this was more a part of the myth-making around her stage persona as a lady giant. Several newspapers across South Carolina ran an article on Williams in 1915, and a reporter had interviewed her directly for it. She was quoted as saying, I was born near Cross Hill in Lawrence County. None of my sisters or brothers are unusually large. For years, every time a showman saw me, he would want me to sign a contract, but I never could make up my mind to leave Columbia. Finally, in the fall of 1896, while I was cooking for a prominent family in Columbia, manager F.C. Bostock got me to sign up for a tour. That article also described her this way, quote, Ella is probably the largest woman in the world. She said yesterday that she has heard of only one woman in the show business whose height was anywhere near her seven and one half feet. In some newspaper articles and advertisements, she's described as even taller than that, measuring almost eight feet. When Williams started performing as a giantess, she went to Europe, likely with the hopes of escaping some of the racism that she faced in the U.S. She became a celebrity, making multiple tours through Europe, as well as performing in Australia, New Zealand, and South America. Her stage name of Aboma, which is sometimes written as Arboma, is said to have been for Abome, capital of the kingdom of Dahomey, which was home to the Agoji. That's the women's fighting force who Europeans nicknamed the Amazons. We have talked about both the kingdom and the fighting force in two prior episodes of the podcast. Some promotional material even implied or flat out stated that she was one of the Amazons. And she seems to have taken this stage name both for publicity reasons and because there was a white woman also named Ella doing similar performances. That was Ella Ewing, the Missouri giantess. According to that write-up in the Devon and Exeter Daily Gazette, in addition to her stage work as a giantess, Williams loved to play the piano and to do needlepoint, and she was, quote, exceedingly clever. And in addition to speaking English as a native, she can also converse in French, Spanish, German, and Italian. Ella Williams had to return to the U.S. at the start of World War I, as her bookings were canceled and travel became more dangerous. It's possible that she hoped to return overseas once the war was over. But in that interview that ran in South Carolina newspapers in 1915, she said that after spending about 15 years away, quote, I will never stay away from Columbia and my people as long as that again. She mentioned that she was planning to open a dressmaker shop. We really don't know what happened to her after this, though. We don't know if she married or had children. Although in the 19-teens, various British newspapers reported that she was trying to find a husband before going back to the United States. Really not clear, though, whether she was looking for a husband and hoping to get married or whether this was more of an attempt to draw people in to see her performances. Multiple photos of Ella exist, uh, many of them with someone else in the picture, sometimes with one of her arms extended straight out from the shoulder with the other person standing under it, or at least appearing to stand under it. Some of these photos look like there's maybe a little shift in perspective going on, although others very clearly look like she's a head and shoulders taller than the people in the photo. She is always very elegantly dressed. In one picture, she is in what looks like a wedding gown. And our last request was from Amanda. I think this was on Twitter, maybe. 
Uh, when I went to try to find it again to, like, fill in these details, I could not find any indication of this message anywhere. So it's a little bit of a mystery. This is artist Zinaida Sherbakova, who was born Zinaida Lancer on December 12, 1884. Now, at the time, this was in the Russian Empire's Kursk province, but today this is part of Ukraine. Zinaida was of both Russian and French ancestry, part of the prominent Benoit family. They were descended from Louis-Jules Benoit, who had fled to Russia after the French Revolution. There were a lot of artists and cultural figures in this family. Zinaida was the youngest of six children, and her parents were both artists, although her father, who had been a sculptor, died when she was only two. Her uncle was a stage designer for the Ballet Russe, and some of her siblings were artists in their own right. Zinaida showed both skill and interest in art from a very early age, and unsurprisingly, given the family's background, they really encouraged her. This included relocating to St. Petersburg so she could have access to broader cultural resources and more prominent teachers. She attended Princess Tineshevka Art School and later studied under realist painter Osip Braz. Zinaida married her cousin, Boris Zherebrikova, in 1905, and after, they went to France for a time so she could continue her study of artistic masterpieces in Paris. She also had two sons, Yevgeny and Alexander, born in 1906 and 1907. At this point, Zinaida Sherbakova was coming into her own as an artist, and most of her work was in the tradition of Russian realism. She painted landscapes of the places she lived and visited, and lots of pictures of people, with many of those pictures focused on women. So she painted peasant women and workers in a way that gave them a lot of dignity, pride, and beauty. She also painted lots of pictures of her children. In addition to her sons, she later had two daughters, Titania in 1912 and Ekaterina in 1913. A lot of her work during these years suggests kind of a quiet joy and a sense of really finding beauty in everyday people and things. Her most famous work may be Self-Portrait at the Dressing Table, which she finished in 1909. The perspective of this painting is as though you're looking out from inside the mirror as Jera Brikova brushes her long brown hair in front of it. She is in a bright, homey room with an array of bottles, pins, jewelry, and two candles spread around the dressing table. Although she had really established a reputation as an artist, Sherebrakova's career went into decline after the Russian Revolution of 1917, also known as the Bolshevik Revolution. She and her family moved to Moscow, and in the wake of the social and economic changes that followed the revolution, they had to live in an apartment with a group of actors. She tried to take advantage of this living situation, which to her and the family was really not ideal, by doing more paintings of these performers. But she was still really struggling financially. This was especially true after her husband was arrested and then he died of typhus while imprisoned. While much of her earlier work had seemed optimistic or serene, some of her work from this period is darker. For example, her 1920 painting House of Cards shows her children, whose father had died the year before, building a house of cards. The color palette is subdued, and their facial expressions all seem to suggest that they're waiting on bad news. In 1923, Sherbakova sold some paintings for a traveling exhibition in the United States, and she used the money to go to Paris with the hope of being able to earn a better living as an artist. But after she left, the Soviet Union tightened its border policies, and she was not allowed to return. Although two of her children were eventually allowed to join her in France, she never saw her mother or some of her other family members again. She did manage to find more patrons and sell more art while in Paris, including taking a six-week trip to Morocco in December of 1928 under the patronage of Baron Jean de Bruyère, a Belgian industrialist. She took other trips as well, but things once again became more difficult as World War II began. When Germany occupied Paris in 1940, she had to renounce her Russian citizenship and stop all contact with her family in Russia under the threat of being sent to a concentration camp. 
After the war was over, she remained in France and became a French citizen, but years passed before she was able to contact her family back in what was at that point the Soviet Union. She lived in France for the rest of her life. The Soviet government offered to allow her to return in 1957, but at that point she was in her 70s and really wasn't well enough to make the journey. Her children came to visit her instead, and one of her daughters helped arrange exhibitions of her work in the Soviet Union in 1965. It was the first time her work had been shown there in decades. She died in Paris two years later, on September 19, 1967. Zinaida Zerbyakova made a name for herself and reached a level of prominence and respect that really were not common for women artists living in the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. But her work and life have not had nearly as much attention as some other women from the 19th and early 20th centuries who had similar artistic careers. She was honored with a Google Doodle in Russia and a couple of other countries on December 10th, 2020 for her 136th birthday. So I went through about a year of emails while working on this, along with going through some of our Twitter mentions and Facebook comments, but those are just way harder to try to go through (laughs) en masse than email is. Uh, I gathered up various requests beyond this one. So uh, we obviously got more, we've gotten more requests uh, for things that would be shorter uh, than could really fit under this umbrella. So there may be other Six Impossible listener requests in the future, just already from what I gleaned together while working on this. uh, There's enough for like two more episodes in the future. Do you have listener email to go with all these listener requests? I do. This is from Greta. And Greta wrote... Uh, Dear Holly and Tracy, I'm one of those longtime listeners who finally decided to write in. I started listening as a student worker in my university archives about seven years ago and never stopped. I recently listened to your unearthed episode and have a funny story related to the second old canoe found in Lake Mendota in Madison, Wisconsin. I live in Madison, and about two months ago, I went on a tour of the State Historical Society archival storage facility. While I was there, I saw the 1,200-year-old canoe. Our tour guide, an archivist for the organization, talked about how difficult it is to store because of its size and the fact that it's being kept completely submerged for preservation reasons. He went on to say it was worth figuring out a place for it because it's not like you find a canoe that old more than once in your life. It was hardly a week later when they found the 3,000-year-old canoe in the same lake. I'm sure they were scrambling to find another place to assemble a water tank. As a funny aside, it's being kept in the same room as a Wienermobile, Packers ice fishing shack, and a giant brewing barrel. It's quite a range of Wisconsin history in one room. Hope you'll consider doing a live show in Madison someday. Uh, and then Greta had two episode suggestions. One, the Pesh to Go Fire. Obviously, this is the email that inspired our most recent Saturday Classic. And the other is the History of Workers' Comp, which, yes, that could indeed be interesting. Greta signed off. Sincerely, Greta. And then also, <laughs> with pictures, kitty cat pictures. We always, always, always love the kitty cat pictures. Thank you so much <laughs> for this. I find this to be a delightful story. Like, Yeah, how often are you going to find a canoe that old? Apparently, more often than you would expect. Uh, If you would like to send us a note about this or any other podcast, we're a history podcast at iHeartRadio.com. We're all over social media at Myths in History, which is where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.